My name is Anjali Pandit. I look after uh, sustainability in the UK. And today we are really excited because we are honored to have BNP Paribas Foundation host this talk for us. So just so you know, you're all live on Facebook right now. We're live streaming to Facebook. <laughs> and um, BNP Paribas Foundation is an excellent part of the BNP Paribas family. They have three major areas that they fund, arts and culture, solidarity, and climate research. And Emily Chen is the head of climate research um, at BNP Paribas Foundation. We fund six million euros every three years. We have a call to projects. So I'm gonna invite Emily up to just say a couple words about the foundation so that all of you know more about it. We fund work at Oxford as well. So she can explain a bit and then she will introduce our excellent panelist today, um, who is research that we funded. So it's thanks to BNP Paribas and all the revenue that we make <laughs> that we can do this. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Anjali, for introducing me. And thank you all for coming. Today is World Environment Day. And at the BNP Paribas Foundation, we have been uh, funding climate change research since 2010. Um, so this is basically a call for project that takes place every three years. It's European and we're funding research um, on climate change and specifically on, for example, endangered species, uh, climate governance, but also coral reefs, um, carbon capture. And um, all these uh, research are um, aiming at raising awareness among you people, among us, among the younger generations on climate change, and they are helping us uh, deciding what to do to help our planet. So today I'm very happy to um, invite the research uh, team for the Reimagine project. Um, this is Jost Verwurt. Um, he's assistant professor for, of foresight for environmental governance at Utrecht University. He's also from the Oxford University, he's the honorary um, research associate. I'm very happy also to introduce you to Caroline Muderman. Um, she's a, a research um, assistant and uh, at the Wageningen University. And there's also Charlotte from the Reimagine uh, project. So thank you for coming and uh, let me um, invite you to the stage to explain what you do for the Reimagine project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. I hope you're having a nice lunch. Uh, so we have a very interactive session planned here today. We want to bring this topic to as close to you as possible. Uh, first of all, though, I will be presenting uh, something about the project and related projects that uh, we've been working on which is hopefully already highly relevant. And, uh, but feel free to interrupt me at any time. We really want to make this a dialogue. So if you're like, oh, this is interesting, I have some thoughts about this, just interrupt. I don't have a lot of slides, so we have more time to kind of talk um, at a relaxed pace. And uh, after that, Carlijn will moderate a conversation with you because uh, we actually want, of course, we'll ask you to ask some questions if you're uh, confused about anything. But then the topic that we're dealing with here is how to imagine futures and how these futures can be used to guide policies, planning, investments, etc., which we think is a highly relevant topic, hopefully, to many of you in the room. And we're very curious about your experience, about the role of BNP Paribas, uh, in, in this kind of the topic of climate, etc. So we want to we want to spend quite a lot of time uh, bringing that conversation uh, to you uh, in the audience. Okay, so on a, one of these many screens, right? You can see uh, the the topic today is how does the anticipation of the future uh, in terms of climate change in interaction with many different drivers of change? We know that there's all kinds of stuff going on that's uh, creating a very uncertain future affect present day policy. And uh, this is, uh, we're going to start a little bit with talking about uh, several projects that relate to that, that uh, uh, one of the uh, projects founded, funded by the Paribas Foundation uh, is part of. So first of all, we're working here with a context in which there's a growing interest in policy all around the world, and also, of course, in the private sector, civil society, etc., to deal with future uncertainty, right? I mean... Uh, uh, it's, in the, it's in the slogan for BNP Paribas, right? The changing world. Huh? So we're in the right place. Um, we're talking about massive pressures, climate change, biodiversity loss, other uh, elements here in terms of uh, environmental impacts uh, in, a, in a time period called the Anthropocene. Does anybody know what that is, Anthropocene? 
Yeah, some people. Yeah. You want to volunteer? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The age of humans. And uh, there are some people who critique this term of the Anthropocene because they say this, uh, this uh, term that we as humans are all together changing the planet geologically hides a lot of politics and a lot of the reality of inequality, right? It's not all humans, it's specific humans, specific parts of society globally who are doing this more than others, to just to be aware of that. Of course, the Paris Agreement and similar activities like this uh, push people towards a need for thinking about transformative change. You will see, you know, transformation is a, is a term that comes up in academia a lot, but you see it increasingly in the discourse everywhere, right? We need transformative change. But what does that mean? That's a question, right? So governments and other actors all around the world are looking for foresight, thinking about the future, to help imagine, anticipate, and experiment with future uncertainties. And how do we, how do we imagine all these things that are changing and how do we get to transformative futures that we would like and avoid transformation that's not so desirable, right? Okay, now time to use the clicker again. So, one thing I wanted to uh, just mention, because this can be confusing. We had a conversation about this uh, with your colleagues in Amsterdam before, where people asked, so why, because the projects that I'll be talking about focus on the, the countries in the world that are most vulnerable to climate change. And people there were like, oh, but why do you focus on climate change adaptation? Uh, you know, on, on adapting and dealing with climate change. Have you given up? And somebody asked, have you given up? Shouldn't we try to prevent climate change? But of course, the reality is climate change is already happening. And no matter how good we are going to be at mitigating future emissions, uh, present day and future emissions, we are going to experience radical climate change, and there are many people around the world who will uh, experience the impacts of this very severely, right? So we need to look at both sides. We need to look at adaptation, we need to look at mitigation. And adaptation is a serious challenge. If we think about food security, if we think about livelihoods, if we think about extreme events, but there are also a lot of opportunities to, uh, to adapt to climate change globally. So just keep that in mind. Now, foresight. Who's got any experience using future scenarios and foresight of any kind? I expect to see some hands at least. Yeah? Ooh. Yeah, we have our work cut out for us. That's okay. Yeah, some, some of you, yeah? Okay. So, um, foresight, thinking about the future, using future scenarios, is a very broad kind of family of approaches that originated in military contexts. Uh, but developed uh, in the 20th century through uh, global think tanks, etc., thinking about geopolitics, thinking about nuclear war, these kinds of fun topics, right? And then was picked up by private sector. Royal Dutch Shell is very famous for developing scenario methods, and many of the people coming out of the Shell pr uh, process have uh, gone on into academia and work on this stuff as well. Of course, if you're familiar in any way with climate change, you also know about the IPCC and the research that goes on to think about different climate change scenarios, which is quantitative modeling work, right? What happens if we have, a, if we have a four, four degrees, global warming, et cetera, et cetera, these kinds of things. And so that's all scenario work. Um, what's very interesting, and scenario, scenarios are used in a private sector context quite a lot, actually, to think about um, what kind of strategies as a business do we need to deal with our competitors, to deal with consumer changes, et cetera, et cetera, and what kind of futures uh, should we be engaging with? And we're always talking here about multiple futures. There's an understanding uh, that we're not just talking about one future that's most likely. We actually need to think about very different futures because the future is highly unpredictable. But what is very interesting is that uh, future scenarios work has been picked up more recently uh, in the last couple of decades already, actually, in multi-stakeholder settings. So what happens if you explore the future, if you explore multiple future pathways together with a wide variety of different societal stakeholders? All kinds of other things come up, right? It's not, uh, if it's no longer your small team in your own company, but you're actually working with civil different civil society actors, different policy makers, um, uh, different uh, companies, etc., to think about what the future could be like uh, together, you end up uh, with a lot of different benefits, such as sharing, uh, getting to know each other's ideas about what the future may be, and finding out each other's assumptions about different, different futures. So that's just to say that this is a, uh, a big field. There's many different methods, many different traditions behind it. Some are qualitative, some are quantitative. 
Um, and that's, uh, that's future scenarios. Really based on that assumption, uh, that idea that we cannot predict the future, we have to work with future uncertainty and uh, we have to think about our strategies and our plans in the face of different futures. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Now let's get a little bit more concrete. So the project uh, funded by the BNP Paribas Foundation is called Reimagine, and I'll um, uh, get back to Reimagine in a minute. But it's based on a, if I may say so, highly successful uh, project that has been going on for about seven years. This is a project uh, from the, the CGIR, which is a big uh, agricultural development research organization that was behind, you know, things like the Green Revolution, and it's a it's a long-standing organization, and they have a, pr a program called Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security. Uh, and part of that program is a project that I've been running for about seven uh, years now uh, called the CCAF Scenarios Project. And this is a project that we've been conducting in seven global regions in Central America, the Andes, West Africa, East Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific with a lot of different stakeholders and, uh, and partners from all around the world, global, regional, national, local level people. And what we've been doing in this project is first we start building regional scenarios uh, about uh, the future of climate change, specifically looking at food security, food systems change, uh, rural poverty, um, climate adaptation, this kind of space of topics. Uh, what we do in this project is we bring uh, policymakers, private sector, civil society people, etc., together from a, from a given region, a uh, one of these global regions, and we say, okay, let's explore all the future um, scenarios that may happen. You know, what could happen if uh, geopolitics go really in an unexpected direction, and how does that relate to climate impacts, for instance? So we get this range of different futures. What's very important about this work is that we uh, really do it with all these regional perspectives in mind, with a lot of expertise filling into this work. Uh, we do use a lot of modeling as well to do quantitative scenario projections. We use agricultural economic models. Uh, we use land use models. The pictures there show, uh, sh show some of our land use modeling work. But we really start with coming, coming, starting with policy realities, starting with the realities of people who are working in these regions, who are dealing with uh, the issues of uh, vulnerable communities. Because if we let our future exploration be framed by quantitative modeling, it immediately knocks out a lot of concerns, right? You can imagine that some of these economic models, they don't really deal well with corruption, right? They don't really do well with cultural changes related to gender, for instance, right? All these things would be dropped out if we just say, okay, let's just sit in our office and do a modeling exercise, right? So we need that uh, broad range of perspectives to start our exploration of the future because everybody's got biases, these models have biases. We as researchers are massively biased and everybody is like that. But if we put everybody together, we can maybe break that space open a little bit. So that's, uh, that's future scenario work, uh, exploring these different scenarios. But what makes this project as the kind of uh, bedrock for the Reimagine project uh, funded by the foundation uh, so exceptional is that we actually don't spend most of our time just kind of exploring the future. Because for those few of you in the room who have done some scenario work, you may or may not recognize this, but it's especially the case if it's, in a mul if it's done in a multi-stakeholder context, that people think, yeah, we need to somehow explore these uncertain futures. We need to bring a bunch of people together and talk about future uncertainty. But they don't really think about why. What kind of questions are we interested in? How are we going to use this work to guide strategies, investment policies, right? I think in companies, this is a typically a little bit less the case. It may be a little bit more focused, especially if you're dealing with uh, companies that have scenario units internally who are, you know, have a lot of expertise with this. But definitely, if you open this kind of stuff up to a kind of societal conversation, it very often, it's very exciting to think about different uncertain futures. But then people go away and they say, well, I've learned a lot, etc. But they don't actually do anything with it. So what we're doing in this project, actually 80% of our time is not spent making all, all these different climate scenarios and socioeconomic scenarios and all these different ideas about these futures, but actually using them to guide national policies. So we're working in these seven global regions, and I think in something like thir around 30 different countries with national governments uh, to work on national policies. So what happens in this case? So let's say the government of uh, Honduras, uh, there's an example here, comes to us and they say, we have a team who are working on a national uh, 
uh, agricultural strategy for climate adaptation. We have some kind of baby version of our, of our strategy. Yeah, there's not much there yet. And uh, we want to make this truly robust in the face of uh, long-term climate change, but we also want to involve a lot of different societal stakeholders in this conversation. So robustness and, and really a, a kind of future smart policy, but also more open to various different interests and different ideas. So what we do, uh, we, this is a process of about typically a year or two years, because that's typically the policy or strategy cycle that we're dealing with. Is people have a draft plan, we bring together with a government like this, we bring together all these different societal stakeholders, and they start to use our regional scenarios that we've made for Central America, for instance, as a and also global scenarios that talk about global economic changes, changes in food prices, all these kinds of things. Use them as a context to, to tailor make specific national level scenarios that are specifically designed to be super challenging for the national policy that people are making. So these scenarios are really made by these uh, various stakeholders from this country to try to destroy and find the weaknesses, et cetera, in the national policy uh, that we're working with, or the national strategy. Uh, so you can imagine if you have completely different futures for Honduras, and things are very different in terms of challenges in each of these different scenarios, that each of them, if you take a strategy like that, you're going to be reviewing it step by step. And there's all kinds of assumptions in there about future funding being available, about capacities of people on the ground, all these kinds of assumptions. These scenarios highlight these problems and they say, look, you're, you're making all kinds of assumptions here that in our scenario definitely don't work. So you can imagine that these people in these different scenario groups are almost like consultants from the future, you know, tasked with critically evaluating the strengths and the weaknesses of this plan. Uh, but they also can evaluate, are there maybe groups, societal groups or interests that are being ignored, that are being damaged, that could ruin um, the uh, actual execution of the plan in question. So you look across all these different future scenarios and then you say, okay, so what's here that we need to change in terms of our strategy to make our strategy robust against all these different futures, right? So how can we come up with a plan that somehow deals with a wide range of different futures? And then we have to keep in mind that we're not trying to predict the future. We accept that the future is highly uncertain, but at least we're not taking one future as our only set of assumptions, which is often implicitly the case. I mean, you may think with this kind of work, Oh, but you know why to go to all this stuff? Because uh, you know we're not interested in kind of this future context. But actually, you're always working implicitly with a future in mind, right? If you're if you're doing any planning, you always have a whole bunch of assumptions about the future, and it's typically one dominant scenario. We're breaking that open. We're breaking that open not only in the, in terms of what other things could happen, but also what other perspectives do exist in society, what other ideas about what the future could be. So you end up with recommendations for making a plan or a policy more robust. But it also um, involves, it can at least, for instance, in the case of Honduras, bringing in a lot of societal issues that are then integrated into this policy or strategy, which makes uh, policy making a lot more inclusive. Yeah? So this is a typical example of what we do. And I don't know, is, does this sound familiar to the few of you who've worked with future scenarios? Not ma maybe not. Yeah. Um, we can also do this the other way around. We work with the Bangladesh Planning Commission, for instance, together with Maliha, who is over here as well, also part of the CCAFs and, and Reimagine team. Uh, we worked uh, very hard there. They were working on their seventh five-year plan for kind of general economic development for the, for the country. Uh, there was very little there yet. We started working with different future scenarios for Bangladesh. And inside each of these future scenarios, people came up with key recommendations for the seventh five-year plan which were then ultimately integrated into the seventh five-year plan. So these are two examples where the recommendations actually ended up in the final plan or policy, uh, were uh, validated, everything like that. And in the case of Honduras, even, I would say that the, that the strategy had, has changed 90%. You know, it's not just like a comma here or there. We're really talking about uh, transformative changes. For instance, in Honduras, there was much more focus on how do we actually structurally deal with long-term climate change. That wasn't really there in the minds of the policymakers before we started with this work. And we also heard from high-level policymakers that uh, many people say that they can really hear, welcome, come in. Hey. That they could hear the voices of the farmers in the policy, which is a bit poetic maybe, but uh, that's what they told me. Yeah. So. Okay. That's all fine, you know, that's great that we're doing that. But this foresight work happens all around the world. And even, uh, you know, with the uh, wonderful uh, uh, processes like ours, eh, 
uh, we may be having a lot of blind spots, right? There may be a lot of things that we're, no that we're missing. I'm originally a foresight person. I'm a, a, a kind of a ecological systems kind of background uh, researcher working on future scenarios. But a few years ago, I felt a strong need to go and look for political scientists and social scientists who are really asking deep questions about what's going on in these kinds of processes. Because this foresight work is dominated by economics, it's dominated by environmental science and by planning sciences. And the, the politics of all of this is rather poorly understood. There's all kinds of things that underlie dominant narratives about the future that uh, you know, people who are wor just working in kind of uh, economics may not realize. So there's a, luckily a whole field of uh, environmental governance research out there. People who do nothing but study you know, this kind of political perspectives of how does climate uh, policy work, how does climate governance work. And we need these people to understand if, our, if what we're doing is actually going to be politically effective or maybe immensely dangerous, right? Who knows? So this is the Reimagine project. This is uh, the project funded by BNP Paribas. And it builds on the experience of the, uh, the CCAF scenarios project and connects to it. And this is really about how do we think deeply about the politics of anticipating future climate uh, change. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. That, that uh, depends, but uh, we're typically talking a multi-decadal. So we're talking about m to the mid-century. But, of course, timelines of policy and timelines of this kind of long-term projection are different from each other, right? So if we talk about the seventh, five-year plan, then the timeline is in the name, right? So what we do is these future scenarios are not just end states. We're not just talking about in 2050 the world will be like this. We're actually describing the whole path that these futures could be developing in. And so we start with a long-term future in mind or a set of long-term futures in mind. And then we work back to say, what does this mean for your five-year plan? What kind of trends, what kind of uh, changes are you seeing already that you have to deal with in the short term? How does it relate to the longer term vision of the country, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we zoom out and then we zoom back in, right? And that's uh, the only way to do it, of course, because otherwise you're ending up with this eternal mismatch between policymaker agendas and, uh, and these longer term futures. But starting with that longer term future perspective or multiple perspectives is quite essential uh, for um, having a more strategic idea of what to do in the shorter term future as well. So this project Reimagine has been going on for, uh, for six months now. We're still in the beginning of a three year project. It is a project uh, co-run by the University of Oxford, the University of Utrecht, Wageningen University and Research also in the Netherlands and a number of regional partners that I'll mention and we already have a first publication out, which may not mean too much to you, but it's a very nice high-level publication together with the co-PI of the project, Arti Gupta, who is in, uh, um, in Wageningen, uh, Associate Professor of Environmental Policy. She's the, uh, the policy kind of um, person next to me as the foresight person, you could say. And, and so we're asking difficult questions to all these activities that are going on where people are trying to deal with the future. Why is this process really undertaken? A question that, I, like I said, is not often asked deeply enough, right? Um, who is funding, who is organizing, who is participating in a foresight process? The work that I was just presenting about uh, the CGIRS research is funded by development money. This means Development, you know, and, you know, global development donors, they want to see impact, right? They don't just want publications. They want to see impact and change on the ground. So in this project, if we didn't succeed in guiding these policies and sh showing very clear evidence that that's what we're doing, we're fired, right? Which puts a little bit of a different incentive on us compared to many researchers out there who just need publications, right? We're, we're funded by this other project, funded by development money. It's life or death, really work towards policy policy outcomes at least, right? Outcomes in the sense of change policy, et cetera. So how do these people who are funding this, who are working on this, how does the future get conceptualized in terms of knowability and manageability? Maybe, maybe you think that the future is highly predictable and somebody else is completely fatalistic and thinks we cannot even think about it because it's scary and, and intimidating. Wha and all of this leads, of course, to different futures being imagined. And then the question is, how are these futures really used in the present? Because the future doesn't really exist, and it really does. Because everything that we're doing, we wouldn't be listening to each other here if we were all going to die in a minute, you know. The future is 
not there yet, but it's hugely dominant on all of our actions. And it's, a, it's what's called a social imaginary, right? It's this space of imagination that we're engaging with together. So how do imagined futures impact upon policy choices in the present is a question that we have in a very nice paper. And you can read the abstract of the paper if you want and leave the rest to the other researchers. But um, so we have, a lot of, uh, we have a lot of regional partners uh, uh, in this project as well, and each of we're working in each uh, of four global regions uh, for our research. Uh, we're working with the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh and in the South Asia region. Um, uh, we're working with GIZ, the German Development uh, Funders, we're working with the uh, Institute for uh, Tropical Agriculture and with um, uh, University for International Cooperation. And what are we doing in this project, right? So whereas in this other project that I mentioned, we're really working on guiding climate policy uh, without engaging with many different processes. In this in reimagine, what we're really doing is looking at everything that goes on in each of these four different regions and understanding how national governments in, for instance, the, uh, the 15 countries of the West African ECOWAS region, what are they already doing to deal with climate change in their anticipation processes? What's going wrong? What's going well? Who's being excluded? Who's being included? So just to really step back and see what's going on and where help can be offered and uh, where things go wrong. We're using this, and that's the first year of the project, and we're in the middle of analyzing this. If you are involved in any way in, in any of these regions, working with national government on climate policies, let us know because we'll be very interested to study what you're doing and to get involved. Uh, because the next step would be, how do we, if we understand um, the politics of climate anticipation better, how do we then improve practice, right? So then we are joining together with this other project, the, the, the scenarios project, to really do some best practice work in all of these uh, four regions to guide policymakers on their climate adaptation efforts. And then, Third year, synthesis and scaling. So we have a lot of partners involved that we would like to help understand how to do better work with climate policy all around the world. There's a lot of activity going on in terms of climate finance, uh, mitigation and adaptation strategies all around the world are being developed and we need to scale up the insights from our project. So in short, it's very policy focused, it's very pragmatic, at least when it comes to policy. But we're studying the science policy interface, right? This is not consultancy. We're, re we're researching uh, the science policy interface. We're interested in aggregating and learning and thoroughly understanding what goes on and, sh and scaling up this stuff without, uh, instead of uh, just keeping our methods to ourselves so we can make money and not telling the competition about our, our foresight methods, right? Which is typically the consultancy approach. So I hope that was an interesting introduction. Uh, Kalen, can you join us? So uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, you c you there's a space for you to ask us questions, but then we would like to flip the classroom and uh, turn our attentions to you as well. So. Yeah, so Joost, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Also, Emily Chan already introduced me really nicely. So my name is Kalein Meideman. I work as a researcher on the project, uh, both at Utrecht University and the Wageningen University. Um, so I hope that Joost, oh well, it was a great presentation. I hope that we have a bit of an, a sense now what the project is about and how we're trying to um, yeah, achieve our end goal. Um, just to start off, uh, are there any questions, clarifying questions uh, that you have to Joost? I have two questions and then I'm gonna leave it to others. So you talk a lot about the politics of anticipating climate. And then there's the science of anticipating climate. How often do those politics and the science actually match? How often are politicians and policymakers in these emerging countries really able to understand the science and make decisions in the long term based on what they're trying to think in terms of voter policy in the short term? And the second question is, when you say that what you're looking at, for example, the ECOWAS countries in Africa, or when you're studying what they're doing today about climate adaptation, can you give us a bit of an example of what is it that they do today? What are they doing to deal with desertification, with flooding, with food shortage, et cetera? Okay, thanks, good questions. So where do, uh, where do the climate politics and the climate science meet? I would say, 
Now we're a little bit biased in our own experience because you know we kind of we really try our best to uh, to meet these two in our own research, right? In these uh, processes that I've been talking about. Uh, but it's more the question, so you, you engage with policymakers on climate, climate change using future scenarios is a very useful method for that. But then the question is, what happens to all the political interests that are competing with the need to deal with climate, right? It's, I would say it's not often necessarily as much a problem of understanding that climate change is a real issue, but it's competing interests that are, that are battling for budgets, that are uh, battling for concern and uh, attention uh, on this topic. I would, I would say that's my my impression, but, uh, but I, then I'm not really yet a part of many really bad climate communication or climate science projects yet. And you know, that's what's interesting about Reimagine. We're going to be engaging with all kinds of efforts from the state of the art stuff to the really bad attempts and failed attempts. And we're gonna be learning from all of this. Um, in terms of what our country's actually doing, uh, well, uh, for instance, a, a big, uh, big topic now is climate smart agriculture. And it, this is the idea uh, that at the lowest levels, at community levels, you try to integrate adaptation and mitigation. So you're trying to transform agricultural practices so that they both contribute to lowering emissions, uh, but that they also make uh, countries, or, uh, you know, farmers and communities more uh, resilient to climate change. Think of practices like agroforestry, right? Combining forestry and agriculture. Uh, so that's, I would say that's kind of the big, the big thing at the moment is climate smart agriculture. People could think of food reserves. One important, uh, one important issue is that a lot of, a lot of climate uh, resilience comes from income, right? Just people having the income to deal with all kinds of stressors. Uh, we typically talk with people who are working on very specific climate strategies all the way up to stuff like what Malia and I have done in Bangladesh, which is really looking at how climate change fits with uh, general uh, economic development planning. And what becomes very interesting there is how other forces of change, like changing food prices, uh, political instability, etc., start interacting with, with climate change. Um, so I would say that typically what we still see is a lot of work by countries that, that uh, focuses on climate change as sort of a niche issue or a specific issue that specific plans and policies for be are being developed for, but that's opening up. Uh, one thing that helps with that, I think, to some degree, and we're just starting that uh, to study that, is also the sustainable development goals, right? To try to integrate all these different concerns, and you probably know all about this as well. Um, yeah, there's many different examples of very specific climate adaptation related to agriculture, related to, uh, to, uh, to flooding and droughts, etc. But I think that the challenge is really to, to have a more integrative approach and really think systemically beyond kind of these typical silos of uh, agricultural adaptation, for instance, or flooding or, yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah. I don't think it's getting better. So my question to you is that the only way to change us and slow down what's happening is changing the value system. But that message doesn't seem to get through because, quite frankly, not much has changed. So why is it not, why do we not get more traction? Why is it not happening any faster? Why are we not changing and reaching out? For my generation, it's too late. But for the next generation, I don't see a change in aspirational values that my values were. So where is it going wrong? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, I mean, things are changing. I, I do think that we do see a global transition when it comes to uh, uh, dealing with emissions, but they're changing very slowly, right? The sh the they're changing slowly. We're going for low-hanging fruits, etc. I mean, what I've been talking about here has been mo mostly been about climate adaptation, right? It's really dealing with the consequences of climate change. But if we don't lower emissions, at some point we, we won't be able to adapt. Or only the rich people will be able to adapt, right? So we have to, we have to somehow limit uh, our climate scenarios to a situation where they're still very serious and challenging, but we can somehow, or and especially the vulnerable parts of the world can somehow still deal with them, right? That's the, that's the challenge. And it is a, a, it is a global shift of values. I have to say, though, I teach uh, the next generation, right? And they're completely different from the previous generation. <laughs> At least, ah, I would say so. Do you disagree? <laughs> no, 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 but... Uh, Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I engage with, uh, with students uh, at Utrecht University every day and not just with sustainability students. And, you know, young people in the Netherlands vote 50% green, right? 
right? So, I mean, there is this, but that's the Netherlands, right? And so we have to think globally as well, right? And this is a, a challenge, yeah. Colin? Great, thank you. I wondered whether you could give any insight as to whether you think um, government and policy making is more effective than the private sector and, the, and business. Um, based on all the scenario planning that you do and then also reviewing back once you know, some time has passed as to which of those two levers are more effective. I think that, uh, that policy making is uh, in what it wants to do nowhere near as effective as, as private sector and business. Uh, I think that that's really an issue, right? So we need to engage with private sector and business in these countries, et cetera, as well. And many, many of the, the countries we're working in that are the most vulnerable also have the, the, pr the most problems with capacity, right? I have a good colleague, uh, we have a good colleague who uh, is from Cambodia, works in Cambodia with the government there. And she says there are about 100 people who are, you know, some sort of expert around climate change in the country, right? And, and then, you know, and only a few of those end up in a, in a situation in government, right? So I would say that the role of the, I mean, it's maybe cliche for all of you, you know, but the role of, the, uh, of government is to help restrict and direct private sector efforts. But of course, private sector uh, can, can do a lot more and a lot faster than, uh, than policy can. We l run in so many, into so many capacity problems and just also mandate and, and, f and resources, right, with, with, uh, with governments and policy. Yeah. Do, you, do you agree? Or? My, my sense is that the private sector, and in fact, I heard this great analogy the other day, which is, it's sort of a cycling analogy, which is um, um, in the peloton, um, you have the private sector leading the peloton. The government isn't even in that first peloton. They haven't even started. And, and the private sector is leading. And if you look at companies like Unilever, et cetera, who are making fundamental changes, not only to their own business, but to their entire supply chain. And they have over a million suppliers. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, 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 the multiplier effect of that is quite significant. So, th so sometimes I wonder whether we just waste too much time. And based on the earlier point, um, that you know, nothing really changes from a policy perspective. It's too slow. And, and the private sector, because it is more dynamic, is our best chance of actually making it into the next century. So can I ask you a question then? Yep. How, d how do you ensure that the private sector moves in certain directions fast enough and also in difficult situations wherein it's not a clear win-win situation? Because I, I think that that's the role for policy, right? Yeah. To help constrict, help uh, sh shape that space that the private sector can act on. I mean, my sense is, you know, private sector businesses clearly will um, look at how they can get some benefit. And uh, again, if you look at the Unilever example, um, they are looking at the triple bottom line, um, so financial, social, and environmental. And funny enough, that's actually translating into a higher share price. Yeah. You know, investors are starting to actually regard Unilever as a better bet than PNG, which is where I used to work. Mm -hmm. You know, PNG hasn't really grabbed this 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 nettle like. Unilever has. So you can see y there is actually a benefit for these private sector companies to actually become more sustainable faster. So therefore, it's a competitive advantage play for them. Can I, can I use your optimism to go back to our more pessimistic uh, colleague over here? Because th so there's, there's stuff happening, right? But, not, but by no means all companies, right? Uh, all industries are doing this. And I don't think that it's necessarily the case that going more towards sustainability is more attractive in, in many industries. So do you or anybody in the audience have any suggestions on the role of policy uh, to help encourage this, this change? I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my look, sorry, I'm gonna omit something. I've learned a lot and- Keep the microphone close. Sorry, uh, I've learned a lot because I was listening to the uh, sort of more public debate in the US about immigration and I was always somebody of free markets and I was always of the opinion <laughs> that uh, this is my generation, one thing at the time <laughs> is, is enough. No, no, but to, to give an answer to my colleague, I think he is right, but there's limits because when I listen to the debate, as much I'm not in favor of some of the policies uh, of, of, of the current president and certainly his famous, he said something very clever that there are limits when you, for instance, come to minimum wage. If you don't enforce immigration, so illegal immigration has an impact in exploiting mm. vulnerable people and therefore creates economic benefit, there's a limit between the free market 
and I think where the government needs to step in. So I unfortunately believe that the free market should be the driver and create the incentives, but there has to be an actual limit where we control to what extent and at what price a corporation can drive change. Yeah, yeah and uh, one of the things that we may well find in this project is that actually in a lot of these processes of national climate adaptation uh, and anticipation towards climate strategies, we don't see any role for the private sector, right? And, that's that, and that would be a really interesting thing. And I, my sense of being, as somebody who's been involved in some of this work, is that that combination isn't, uh, isn't very strong in many places of the world. Uh, you know, if you think about the reasons for participation, what scientists typically say is, we need to bring many societal perspectives in because we need to understand what is going to happen or what may happen. But we need also the people in the room who can actually make change happen. And then the third reason, uh, legitimacy, is we want, we want people in the room who may be affected by the change, right? So we want the vulnerable in the room, we want the people who can actually make the change happen, and we want the people who can understand what may happen all together, right? A little bit of social science uh, uh, to help our foresight work. Yeah. So maybe we can have a look also oh, here. Oh, there's a, here. a question here. Okay, so we'll back to your question about what the government should do to. Uh, I think your microphone's not on. Maybe you Sorry. can just uh, maybe. What the government should do to push the private sector in the right direction. Of course, I mean, economic theory will tell you that uh, if you tax uh, the negative externalities coming from, uh, you know, polluting industries and so on, or adding uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, you, you achieve. Uh, the desired results. So there should be, in my opinion, more forthcoming uh, uh, action on that front. Then I have a question, though, for you. You spent in your slides some time on, uh, on the agricultural side, uh, which seems to be raising awareness, uh, bringing some uh, resources also yeah. into that direction. However, you just touched very briefly on uh, uh, the, the risk of flooding. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, and this is something that affects uh, rich and poor. Yeah. It's not just... Uh, you know, Coming from the, the Netherlands, the country yeah. exactly. So, two. So, first of all, what is the scenario there? Because uh, it strikes me that uh, I mean, uh, the, the the ice is melting as we speak. Yeah. We are not yet seeing, uh, you know, water reaching our feet, but uh, I mean, it should be coming pretty soon. So, what is the scenario, first of all? Well, and <laughs> because I don't I don't hear enough about that. And, and quite frankly, on agriculture, back in agriculture, there are winners and losers there, right? Yeah. There are champagne companies buying land in the UK yeah. because it's warming. So there are some winners here. But on the coastal side, uh, I think there are only losers. So what are the scenarios and what are the actions that are being taken? Yeah, I mean, there are also people, it's a slightly different topic, but who are uh, investing in rhino horn because they're banking on the extinction of the of, you know, rhino species. So, yeah, there's always winners and losers, right? And the rhinos definitely lose in this case. But, um, well, that's a really interesting question. So, how many people here do know, uh, know anything about climate tipping points? Or is that a, yeah, okay. <laughs> Julie knows. So, climate tipping points is a really interesting topic. Uh, actually, as climate, as uh, uh, global temperatures increase, all kinds of global systems, so as, uh, for instance, polar ice, uh, uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, Amazon rainforest, the monsoon in South Asia, etc., may reach a point where the likelihood of, the, of these things fundamentally changing increases to the point of certainty. So we see a collapse of polar ice, right? At some point it tips, and um, some people say it's already tipping in, in terms of polar ice. Um, but longer, later, in the, later in, the, in the coming century, we may see um, all kinds of global uh, kind of climate subsystems collapsing. Uh, we may see the disappearance, uh, disappearance of the northern forest suddenly. And what's really interesting, I've been in a, involved in a project. Um, there was another global climate convention recently in Bonn, a small one in between the big ones, you know. And here we had people, national delegates, involved in a simulation where we were together experimenting with this notion of climate tipping points. Because shockingly, a lot of people involved in climate negotiations have very little understanding that we're not just uh, talking about gradual climate change, but that entire global systems may suddenly collapse. And this has massive impacts on food security, on all kinds of things, right? On flooding and, the, you know, these kinds that can suddenly increase um, exponentially. And uh, what I actually thought before we started, this is kind of a climate, climate communication project. We're trying to get these people familiar with this work by doing simulation gaming, and uh, we also have ideas about VR, et cetera, with this. What I actually thought was that these kinds of subjects are very uh, esoteric, that thinking about specific systems collapsing is even further and more 
abstract, uh, further away from people's normal lives than normal climate change. But actually, if you start talking about the disappearance of all the northern forests, you know, climate change becomes something you can actually think about, right? And so what we actually found is that uh, thinking about these tipping points that can suddenly lead to massive floods that, that lead to the disappearance of entire global ecosystems really brings this stuff home a little bit more. So people there in this process uh, indicated that they were more concerned, but, it, but they also understood more what climate change could actually mean. So why, why don't we see it yet? Well, I mean, let's ask that question in another 20 years, because this could go very quickly, very soon. And, and for, the, for, for instance, Europe, and you know, thinking from a, a Dutch perspective, it mainly looks like this is going to be super expensive, right? But for other parts of the world, it could be life and death. So, yeah. We can take uh, two or three more questions. Uh, we have five more minutes, I think. Yeah, I, I want to actually turn the camera around for at least a little bit. We've got a bunch of questions here. Uh, on the board, and maybe this also for uh, Anjuli to, to get uh, involved for the last uh, last couple of minutes uh, with these questions. Um, so we should pick one, I guess. Yeah, we are very interested in when you hear all of this. What could this what could this kind of foresight work mean, and specifically participatory foresight, where you involve all kinds of societal actors, mean for BNP Paribas and its various activities, and also in terms of BNP Paribas' involvement in uh, national policy making, these questions around private sector versus uh, government, etc. right? Any thoughts? And Julie, yeah, is it on? I don't know if everybody's fully aware. I know Matthew knows a bit about this because we've had to answer questions to the Bank of England recently on it. But at BNP Paribas, we have started doing research as to what is climate risk and what does that mean like physically assets under our control or with our investors, what is the risk? And I don't know if some of you were here in the morning, but we put up a slide that if sea levels are rising at the rate that we think that they're rising, by 2070, there's a whole lot of assets and value at risk in New York, in Miami. Of course, there's a huge population at risk in Mumbai, in Shanghai, etc. And so what we are now starting, and it, we, I have to say we're really in nascent stages. BlackRock, for example, is way more advanced at really modeling climate risk and looking at what does that mean in terms of how would they advise on investment, how would they even approach emerging economies and advise sovereigns, you know? And so we are trying to understand, you know, what does that mean in terms of if there's a carbon price in the future, what could that mean in terms of a financial risk of, of carb the price of carbon, and also the physicality of if there's flooding, if Antar you know we like we saw in Antarctica with the Larsen B shelf collapsing, you know what if the next um, Larsen shelf collapses before anybody expects that it would, but this is a huge scope, right? I mean, I mean, there's so much more that we need to understand, and I think what I'd like to ask sort of or sort of have some people around the room, I know Alexandra is here is working on sustainability for FIC, is you know, these other societal actors, because we get this a lot, we have a, um, a policy that says we will not finance any new coal power plants, right? And what we get back from clients and from advisors and from partners is saying, you know, but you have 420 million people in India who don't have access to electricity. So you say that you're about the sustainable development goals. If you're interested in the sustainable development goals, don't you want them to have hospitals? Don't you want them to have schools? Are you really waiting 20 years until we can actually bring them the right quality of climate policy solutions? That's your adaptation mitigation question. How do I save people today, so that, but in a way in which I'm still saving them tomorrow? So maybe you could, I mean, I don't know if there's somebody else in the room who's talked to clients, had that conversation, has had ways that they, Delphine, have you thought about it before? Have you had ways in which you've thought about how do we explain this? Because we all need to have a strong story that we share together, you know? And, and it'd be people like you need to help input yeah. to how we address that because we have a certain value system we want to share. Yeah, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of research coming out now on the sustainable development goals, specifically on this question of energy versus other other needs. And actually a lot of work shows that there's a lot of possibilities for synergy, right? That the, the, the positive relationships between energy needs and access to energy and other 
uh, sustainable development goals are actually much greater than the, than the trade-offs. So, I mean, just having evidence to work with and good stories coming out of that kind of work would be very important, I think. Yeah? Arguably, these governments that you work with yeah. are supposed to be putting the SDGs, the UN yes. United States Sustainable Development Goals, the COP21 agreement completely into yeah. their investment yeah. plans, right? Into yeah. their infrastructure development. We uh, just a, a minor anecdote. At the moment, we have a, uh, a course uh, uh, with 143 s uh, sustainable development students who are working with 30 countries at the same time this month on the uh, sustainable development goals implementation planning, which is all about these kinds of questions. So, yeah, it's true. Everybody's working on this, and this is the moment to, to get in and get into these conversations. Yeah. Who are the leaders which of these emerging countries that you're that you're working with, which one do you feel are the leaders? Which country should we be in investing in more <laughs> excitedly? Yeah, that's a good question. We don't work with all countries around the world. Uh, I would say that we've got a lot of good experience working with Bangladesh on these kinds of topics, right, for instance. Um, and uh, Costa Rica is a special case, but Costa Rica is a kind of a special case in, in, in any case, right? Uh, I would say that there are many countries that are, you know, in this kind of mi getting into this middle income zone that are where they're also in the climate negotiations taking a double role as vulnerable countries, but also people supporting uh, uh, in, in mitigation and, uh, and action and uh, global climate funding. So these, these types of places like Kenya, Ghana, uh, yeah. Yes. So we often hear the sort of the 80-20 rule. Does that apply here at all? Is you know 80% of the problem caused by 20% of the sources, and is there easy fixes? I think that uh, there are quite a few people in the audience who know the answer to this. I would say that it's much more than 80-20, right? In terms of emissions, it's uh, only certain parts of the world are much more uh, co much higher contributors in terms of emissions. Companies, you know, this is we're talking. We're not talking about the majority of the planet here. So I would say it, I would say it's more like what would it be? I don't know, if ninety-five, five, or something like that, at least. Yeah. So yeah, but but this is an this is a mitigation question, of course, right? We where do we start? Uh, uh, of course, policy in the U.S. currently isn't really helping. But uh, yeah. unfortunately, I think we've run out of. Well, okay, last question, and then that's it. It's interesting you mentioned Costa Rica because uh, I was in Costa Rica last month and um, it actually struck me how advanced they are in terms of uh, what they want to do in terms of climate change. When you talk to people, they are really involved for, for a country that is still emerging. So it's quite surprising. At the same time, what I saw also is, uh, you know, we hear about deforestation, about the um, um, palm oil uh, development in Indonesia and the problem that it creates. The problem is that as uh, Indonesia is being restricted. Uh, some companies are actually diverting their investment in Costa Rica. So you see at the same time a lot of deforestation happening in Costa Rica uh, with the, uh, you know, so what, what uh, my point was basically these countries, they sometimes don't have all the, the triggers, the control on what they want to do. Yeah, they are the very dependent on large corporations that take decisions. So it comes back to that same, same question. Yeah. In 30 uh, seconds. Yeah, uh, no, 100%. Uh, colleagues of ours are working very closely with uh, the government of Costa Rica on energy policies, etc. One interesting thing I wanted to share there is that the needs of the Sustainable Development Goals and the, and the Climate Convention and, and the Paris Agreement uh, have prompted the Costa Rican government to completely change the way that they deal with imagining futures, going away from kind of kind of old style historical projections to using methods to imagine transformative change to inform their nationally um, determined contributions to climate mitigation. So these things are shifting the way that people imagine the future and it affects uh, their investments in the present. And, and, and I would le maybe leave it at this kind of question around role of the private sector versus government and how we can make that combination happen and change things more quickly than they have so far. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> I think.